Today I've got somebody from the gun community, a special guest that we're going to be talking about guns, we're going to talk about some politics, he's very involved in the gun community, loves guns, he's a class 3 FFL, that means he can manufacture and sell machine guns and all the naughty things that the ATF doesn't like. He's obviously a veteran and he runs a very well-known YouTube channel on firearms, Iraqi Veteran 8888. And uh, he's got a big following on YouTube. I think you're close to like 3 million subscribers, I think. 2.7 like right? million now. 2.7 yeah. 2. million. He's got a huge following on uh, Twitter, which is actually how, how we met because we have a lot, a lot of very similar uh, political views as well as the Second Amendment. And obviously, any of you guys have been following me for a while know that I'm hugely pro-Second Amendment because without the guns, we got we got no country. So... Eric, if you this is Eric Blanford, by the way, I don't think I said your name earlier, but That's okay. Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and right. what what you do and uh, your expertise? Then also, he's very involved in the litigation and going after and suing the federal government and other um, members of the local, state, and city governments that are infringing upon our Second Amendment rights. So I appreciate that. He's one of the guys that's helping to keep the government out of our business so the spirit of the second amendment shall not be infringed actually means what it says Corey, so, well, man what a great intro thank you so much dude and i really appreciate the invite to come down and hang out with you and um i've really enjoyed our time together so far we've had some very enlightening discussions and i'm sure we're gonna you know get into more details and stuff and i love your studio man you like you got a great thing going on you know so Real, kudos to you, man. You got a great setup and really enjoy what you're doing. And um, I've been at this thing for a while, man. You know, I've, I've been on YouTube now for about 15 years. I'm kind of like one of the OGs in the in the in the gun world in terms of like you know putting out content on YouTube. And I'm just kind of one of those guys that like I'm a well known average guy. I'm just a redneck with a video camera that just happened to like you know see some success with it and. I don't know. I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole inadvertently. I, I didn't really mean to do what I'm doing now. I just sort of created my position. Uh, the job didn't exist when I first started doing this. And, you know, now we have this social media content creator. And what are you, uh, an influencer? Like, when I first started doing this, none of those things were a thing. It was just literally just rednecks in a field with guns, with cameras, and we were just documenting things that we happened to already be doing just for fun and putting a little content out. And, Turns out a lot of folks really enjoyed what we were doing and uh, wanted to be a part of it. And here we are, 2.7 million subscribers later and uh, 750 million lifetime views on the channel. So you know, three quarters of a billion views over the course of the last, you know, 15 years. It's been a, a crazy road. You know, Twitter's doing great. You know, Musk, Musk uh, took over the reins over there. And, you know, we've seen some good growth on Twitter. So um, that's working out well. So. And just doing our thing. I took uh, the Georgia State Director position for Gun Owners of America last year. So uh, I've got the reins up there in Georgia. So, you know, getting involved on the on the litigation front, suing the crap out of the uh, ATF. Uh, right now we have our, um, our firearms uh, FFL coalition. Okay, we're actually suing the ATF for their increased revocations. Right now revocations are up an astronomical amount. And the ATF are going after gun dealers and shutting them down for even the smallest clerical errors on paperwork. Very tiny little human errors that we're all capable of making and that we all will eventually make a little minor paperwork error. But they're shutting down people over the dumbest little things. So we set up a coalition of FFLs to get together and sue the ATF. So we are suing the ATF over the revocations. Because it's basically the current occupant of the White House is anti-gun and so anything he can do to gum up the works. And the way they look at it is if they have less FFLs, in other words, you've got less firearms dealers that you can buy guns from, that in their eyes, well, that'll have less guns in society because they believe less guns equals less crime, even though statistically in peer-reviewed study after peer-reviewed study, if you've ever studied any of John Lott's work of the Crime Research Prevention Institute, I believe it is, or Crime Research... Institute Prevention Center, I think, is is what it is. He's laid all these out. I've posted these things on my uh, Instagram for years. It usually gets people fired up on the left because that's against what they've been told or propagandized. And so I forgot what my train of thought was. The hell was I even talking about? 
we were t- we were talking about FFLs and um, you know them oh. shedding. Like if if you have less FFLs, yeah. the the theory in their mm-hmm. mind is well, then less people will own guns, less people will buy guns, and and it does disenfranchise a certain amount of people within society who you know maybe there maybe the gun store that's in your town is the only gun store in your town. Well, if that gun store gets shut down, how are you going to buy a gun? Where are you going to go? Are you going to have to drive a town over, two towns over, a county over, right? So what if you don't have a lot of money for gas? Like, what if you're trying to pinch every penny? Like, so it does disenfranchise people who need to have access to FFLs, you know, in order to have guns transferred in, to buy a firearm. So uh, in their mind, they think, well, the less gun dealers there are, then the less available guns will be, which may be true, but it's also very disingenuous on their part because, you know, they're literally just doing it to harm the livelihoods of the people who engage in the gun business. This this isn't really about necessarily trying to, to prevent guns from being out there. I mean, guns are super common. They're everywhere. They're, you're going to buy a gun no matter what. They're, they're all over the place. This is just really more about punishing the people who engage in the business of dealing firearms. More yeah, to make it more expensive, more oh, yeah. cumbersome, to gum up the works, to make things more difficult, and in essence, discourage something that, even though the Second Amendment says shall not be infringed, they have every intention on infringing upon it and trying to get away with whatever they can get away with. They want to force people to be of the mindset of, you know what, we're thinking about going in business, we're thinking about going in the gun business. They want them to go, Wow. We look at all these revocations. Look how hard this is. Like, you know what? Being in the gun business may not necessarily be worth it because look at look at what could happen. So they want to discourage people from getting involved in the gun business. That's the real reason. Yep. They want to discourage a behavior that they are not a fan of because they want to run and regulate every aspect of our lives. And they think they're us clueless, unwashed masses or the clueless rubes that we don't have any guns or anything to protect ourselves because they don't believe we're competent enough or smart enough to have our own weapons, despite the fact that when you statistically look at it, a, a police officer versus somebody that's concealed carry when a, a shooting happens, the police are typically about three times more likely to shoot an innocent person versus somebody that's concealed carry. And it just comes right down to training because the police don't train very often. And like, you know, I'm not going to mention the police department, one of my local police departments here. I was talking with one of the SWAT officers a couple of years ago, and he's like, we get four hours of firearms training per year. And that basically entails going to the gun range and shooting at some paper targets, typically with a pistol, a shotgun, and some kind of AR style rifle. And if you've ever seen some of the the targets from some of these agencies and the gun range, it's no wonder that the police are three times more likely to shoot an innocent person than somebody that's concealed carry like myself, like Eric, just because we train. Like the pistol that I carry most with me, I've got over 12,000 rounds through that particular pistol. And I seriously doubt the the overwhelming majority, probably 80, 90% of the police officers, not a single one of them has ever fired that many rounds in their practice or their whole career. It's a very small percentage of police that are pro-gun and actually take the time to train to be competent and safe with their firearms. If a surgeon only picked up a scalpel one time a year, would you trust that surgeon? No. Right. I mean, I want to, I want my, I want my uh, surgeon to be very well, you know, to know his tools inside and out, right? Like, you know, that gun is, is the scalpel, right? If you're a police officer, you got, you're going to rely on that pistol to protect yourself, to enforce the law, to do whatever. You know, yeah, if you see something dangerous, you see, you know, someone who's a victim, they're being hurt. I think that the thought in a lot of people's minds is that police want to do the right thing. They want to be the person that's going to be there to help someone. Like, most of them are great people, and they do want to see, you know, um, everyone be peaceful. And, that, and, you know, trust me. In the back of their mind, they have the complex of uh, being the person that saves the day. Who doesn't want to be that person? I, I get that. I understand that. But you got to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. I mean, you, just to want to be that person is not enough. Like you, you have to be that person. You have to, you know, put all of the uh, circumstances in place that make you that John Wick uh, sort of person. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess. Uh, and unfortunately, most guys in law enforcement are just not going to take the time. Number one, they're on a fixed income typically. And number two, it's like they don't want to spend the money on training or ammunition because that gets expensive. That that adds up. 
And to them, they're content with just going to a gun range and shooting a couple times a year at some paper targets that don't move or don't shoot back. And then when they get in a real-world gunfight and they've never done any kind of force-on-force training where people are actually shooting back at you, they freak out. And, you know, that's why you'll see people in police shooting videos empty their magazine, throw another one in, empty that magazine, and not even hit the bad guy once. And meanwhile, bullets are flying all over the place. They kind of, you know, a lot of police shootings look like Hollywood movies, whereas when you look at somebody like a, a George Wilson, I think was his name, the one that was uh, that the church shooting a couple Jack of years Wilson. ago. Jack Wilson. Think, yeah, his name's Jack. He's, uh, you know, apologize for messing up the name. But if you saw the shooting, you had somebody come in the entrance with a shotgun, shot a couple people, and unfortunately, one of the other security people was just too slow. I think they, they were taking their gun from their hip. And they got shot and killed. But um, George pulled out his pistol, boom, one shot to the face, and the dude dropped like a sack of potatoes, and it was over. And that's the difference. Now, somebody like George, who's an instructor, who's hundreds of thousands of rounds maybe through pistols and rifles over the course of his life versus your average police officer that gets four hours of firearms training per year, who do you want to rely on? Because people think, oh, the police are supposed to keep us safe. They're trained right and properly. But what most people don't realize is 99% of the police are not. They are not the people, you know, like my friend John says, he says, most police I would not want shooting around or near me. And <laughs> I've been at the gun range many times when the police show up, you know, because they have classes and stuff and they're pointing their guns at themselves or pointing at us and each other. They're some of the most dangerous and incompetent people to be around when they have weapons. And that's why when, when we're done training, well, I want to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. What I find to be odd is that they're the same people that wants to try to tell me what I should own or shouldn't own, you know, and then, oh, anytime there's some sort of a gun ban discuss, oh, it's always going to be uh, military and, and law enforcement is going to be exempt. Yeah, well, of course they're going to be exempt, you know. Oh, they should be exempt and their incompetency. But, you know, me and my everlasting competency that I work very hard to maintain, I somehow should be regulated uh, simply because you don't agree that, you know, that I should be able to protect myself and that you should not have a monopoly on violence. At the end of the day, we have to remember that, you know, the government desperately wants a monopoly on violence, and that's really what uh, gun control in their mind is really about. Like, they always say that it's under the guise of public safety. The truth is it's about their safety. It's They want to have monopoly on violence. They want to be the only people that have guns. And we know what happens in any type of regime, no matter what type of government it is. When the government is the only people that have guns, we know where that leads. All right, that that's been well well documented, well storied. It's a story as old as time. We know what happens when only the government has guns. And the re- only reason why people want to ban guns, especially the politicians, is the reality is deep down they want to do things to their citizens, their s- subjects. I guess the way they kind of look at it, that would get them shot. And so, therefore, they can't do what they really want to do, and that's why they want to get rid. They want to prevent us from having having guns because they know deep down the overwhelming majority of people are not going to be going along with their agenda. It's like, especially when you look at the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and Gates and all the rest of the self-appointed global elite, the Michael Bloomberg's of the world, BlackRock, and all that. Yeah, all of them, Vanguard, all of them think that the the rest of us idiots should not be armed and that only police and military should have firearms when the harsh reality is the majority of those people compared to people that are enthusiasts that that train constantly because shooting is a perishable skill if you don't practice if you don't dry fire you're going to be rusty and it's going to be a lot harder to hit something when you're under stress, if you haven't been practicing recently. And that is the daily reality of most police officers. There was a, a shooting a couple of years ago um, on I-95 in, uh, was it Hollywood, Florida, you know, Miami-Dade area. And so there was a UPS driver. He had just gotten a job. It was his first day on the job. And he gets carjacked by some dirtbag criminal. <sighs> And so the guy's on 95, and then, you know, everybody, he gets blocked in by the police. And then so the guy, you know, has his arm around the dude's neck, and he has the gun to his head, basically. 
and then he starts walking to get out of the UPS truck because it, you know it's blocked in or he's not driving anywhere. And so he starts shooting at some of the police. And there were, I think it was six or eight officers that returned fire. And they hit the suspect and killed him, but they also killed the hostage. And they killed, I think it was two other people that were sitting in their cars on the other side of the UPS truck. And there was something like 200 rounds fired from like five or six cops at, you know, trying to hit one guy. uh, Did the Israelis train those guys? (laughs) So they end up hitting, you know, this, you know, killing the the guy that was a hostage. They they killed the bad guy and they killed two other people that were just sitting in their cars that were blocked in traffic (sighs) because these cops freaked out. They never had done any kind of force on force training. They'd never had anybody shooting back at them and they lost their shit and they emptied their magazines in the direction and most of those bullets didn't even come close to hitting the bad guy and that's a tragedy and that's what happens but most people don't know they think if the police show up and they got a gun they know what they're doing they know how to use it but that's the harsh reality and you know this particular um county got in touch with one of my friends and um not that county but the county next to it and they said, we just saw what happened on 95, and we want you to come train our officers because we don't want to have anything like that happen. Because it's terrible PR. You get you know six police officers that basically execute an innocent person or three innocent people because they're incompetent and they're not properly trained. I mean, that's a terrible situation. And I'm not saying that what they did was correct, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to cover for them or anything. But just from a standpoint of human behavior and and what we do in that fight or flight reflex uh, type of environment, right? Well, you know, if you're taking fire and you have to end the threat, only thing that was on their minds was to end the threat. Now, obviously, what they did was terrible, and you know, it's it's bad to to you know shoot people that you don't want to shoot, right? And we got to be more discretionary about that sort of stuff. Um, however, at that basic core human level. All they could probably think was, oh, my gosh, this person is shooting a gun at me. And, and I'm sure that's scary. You know, you're getting shot at. You're having to analyze, oh, my gosh, you know, there's people in the area. This guy's got a hostage. What the heck do I do? But are you going to sit there and get shot at? And, you know, we could say all day long, we can play Monday quarterback and say, well, you know, yeah, if they were better trained, would they have acted differently? Yeah, they, they would have. Yeah, there's probably some really well-trained guys like Jack. They could just, boom, pull out the pistol, one shot, one kill, d- done, in the threat. Of course, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be the case, but I also understand that they probably were, were thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, what if, what if this guy hits someone else? What if they kill me? Like, that fight or flight reflex does come into play, and we have to train our officers on how better to deal with those stressors, right? They need to have more of a decision-making process when it comes to their training. And of course, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it that we won't discuss here. That's a completely different scenario to talk about tactics and things like that. But it is tragic, you know, and it is a PR nightmare when you see uh, police agencies that are involved in these crazy shootings and they end up hurting innocent people. And it paints a really, really bad uh, error (laughs) for law enforcement. And if anything, it makes a guy like my job easier because... When they talk about wanting to ban guns and, oh, only only uh, law enforcement should have guns and all this sort of stuff, I can go, really? Exhibit A. Really? Only law enforcement should have guns? Is this the example you want to use? You want to go there? There was another <clears throat> shooting that just came to mind. It was last two, three years I remember seeing it. There was a cop. Uh, I think it was somebody had a dog that was going bananas or something like that. And so this guy, um, this police officer shows up, and it's a woman walking her dog, and the dog's barking. I don't know if it was on a leash or not. And so the guy pulls out his pistol and because he's afraid of the dog and shoots at the dog. He do, I don't think he hit the dog. He ends up hitting her, and she ends up dying and, and bleeding out. You can hear her going, oh, you shot me. you know. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, he kills her by accident because he's – a dog caused his nervous system to overload to the point where he couldn't aim or shoot straight. He ends yeah. up, this woman lost her life. And there was a one female officer that um, went to draw her taser to tase the suspect oh, yeah. and, and accidentally drew a Glock and shot yep. the guy. Yep. And even on the, on the body cam footage, she's like, oh my God, you know, like, 
she didn't mean she knew she didn't meant, meant to do it like she knew it was a mistake and admitted that mistake but it's like that's it like once that bullet leaves a barrel you can't take yeah. it back it's leaving trust me it is leaving that barrel and it is not coming back there are no, no do-overs i think she went to jail didn't she get sentenced to prison for that i, I think she might have i think she might have but wow what a mistake a mistake that cost someone their life you know, that's not the kind of environment we we'll want to paint for anybody, much less law enforcement. I mean, society can say what they want, but at the end of the day, someone's law enforcement, they're expected to be accountable and they're, they're expected to have a higher degree of accountability than just anyone, in my mind. If you wear the uniform, any uniform, military uniform, police uniform, you're held to a higher standard. You should know better. So when it happens to someone like that, it really does paint a clear picture. It's like, like, wow, people are fallible. Like, people make mistakes. We're all human beings, right? You know, I'm not suggesting that a mistake should cost someone their lives, but gosh, we got to do better. Got to do better. Definitely. For sure. So why don't we just start, uh, let's start with question number one. <clears throat> so I want to talk about ATF, the pistol braces. There's a legal fight that's going on. And so the pistol braces all came about where, I mean, really it was started to help vets that had lost, you know, typically an arm. And so the, the pistol brace typically goes around your forearm and your hand goes in the grip. So it enabled these guys to be able to, to shoot and train with their guns. And so over the years, there was the, was it SB Tactical? I think it was. They had several of them that they submit, I think the ATF approved a couple of them as, well, if you've got this on the gun, it's not a short barrel rifle, it's a pistol. And even when Trump was in office, the ATF was basically trying to undo that and go after these pistol braces. And now that Joe Biden has been in office, the people that he's got running the ATF now, then they just basically wanted to say anybody that was using a, a pistol brace is basically pistol brace has turned their pistol and or their pistol rifle into an actual short barrel rifle which falls under the nfa the national firearms act meaning you got to go through another background check and another process wait up to a year 14 months whatever and pay an extra 200 bucks another tax to to the government for the privilege of just having a rifle that's a few inches shorter than a normal long rifle and so there are millions and tens of millions of these things in society. And so in essence, what they're trying to do is make all of these people felons overnight. And if they don't like you, they can use that to come after you and put you in jail and prevent you from ever owning a gun again because now you're a convicted felon. And so that is working itself through the court system. And so uh, it was Firearms Policy Coalition. Yep. And was there a few others? Or just uh, yeah, we've got, so so Firearms <clears throat> Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America, as well as the Second Amendment Foundation, their uh, members were initially covered under that initial injunction uh, in the Fifth Circuit that came down on the brace issue. Now there's a nationwide injunction that covers everyone, whoever owns one. Um, so it has, for all intents and purposes, been sorted out in the courts and you know the atf is likely going to um appeal take this it, back to assume, court right? and appeal it and everything like that but you know it could go to the supreme court and honestly if it does it's going to have to pass the brew and smell test and remember that all of this stuff with braces happened under obama's atf right so we're talking a, a democrat controlled uh you know majority atf that you know is under obama's marching orders they approved the original brace letter okay then what the atf tried to do is, is backpedal and say, well, we're not going to tell you what you can and can't do with these braces, but we're not going to issue individual determination letters uh, for various devices anymore. So it used to uh, be you could say, here is a configuration of a certain gun, and I want to know if it violates the NFA, and I'm going to submit photos and a sample and send it over to the tech branch, and then the tech branch would issue an opinion letter that said yay or nay, Right. So the way that they put a stop in that is by just refusing to offer any more opinion letters, any more determination letters. So a determination letter was sent out uh, with the original um, SB Tactical brace design, and it was found to be uh, completely not in violation of the NFA. I mean, the ATF sort of, you know, de facto improved it, right? They basically said, hey, you're good. Yeah, said, okay. you're, you're good. It's not a short barrel rifle. This is totally legal. Right. It was a pistol with a brace on it. Well, 
uh, the floodgates kind of opened. And then, you know, people started putting fold mechs on them and then making braces that, you know, had all different types of configurations and things like that. And um, the ATF didn't like it because they thought that, you know, people were skirting the NFA or something like that by, by having these types of devices and things. Um, it was originally uh, made to help people who, you know, suffered injuries and, and couldn't hold up an AR pistol very well. Most of these people are wheelchair bound and things like that. So it is a helpful device uh, as a prosthetic device is what it was originally um, approved as. And I think if there were some distinction that were going to be made, let's say if we looked at the FBI crime statistics, okay, the crime statistics uh, are broken down into a lot of very useful data. Like we know how many people are murdered with rifles, with shotguns, with pistols, with gravity, with water. I mean, look, like we know what kills people. We keep very detailed records of all of this data. So if for the 12 or I think it was like 12 or 13 years that braces have been on the menu, they've been legal uh, and they've been out there, like at the tune of, you mentioned 10 million, some estimates were that there could be as many as 40 million like some crazy amount, like it's an ungodly amount of braces that are that are purported to be out there. Well, uh, if the if the FBI wanted to draw the distinction, the clear distinction between a rifle and a pistol equipped with a brace, like let's say that brace pistols started showing up in a ton of crimes. I'm talking actual crimes, not just showing up in a drug raid and then there's a brace pistol and a pile of drugs or something. That's not the same thing. We're talking about a verifiable incident where a braced pistol was specifically used to murder someone and then it becomes a part of the FBI crime statistic data, right? If that statistic was so damning and important for the FBI to draw that conclusion of why braces needed to be banned, then wouldn't they have set up a pool of data specifically to target those particular items as being some sort of crazy problem? There is, there is nothing in the FBI crime statistics that specifically tailor braces as a specific item that is separate from rifles or pistols or shotguns, right? So it's kind of weird, too, that they also don't make a distinction between a handgun, right, a regular pistol like a P365 or a Glock 19, and like an AR or AK pistol, what the ATF wants to consider a large frame or rifle caliber pistol or something like that, like a Draco that shoots 762 by 39 or an AR pistol that shoots 300 blackout or 556. Five, For the purpose of this argument, we'll just say, let's not worry about AR pistols and other PCCs that shoot nine millimeter. Let's just say rifle calibers. If there was a distinction that was so important that it was some crazy violence epidemic that was occurring as a result of these these things being the out God, there, the violence don't of, you? The epidemic of gun violence. Right. If that were true, don't you think that the FBI crime statistics would make a distinction, right? If there's a category for rifle, shotgun, pistol, whatever it is, wouldn't they create a category for that item in order to prove the point? Hey, we had to create this category because this is showing up in, a, in, a, in an extraordinary amount of crimes compared to the other gun designs, but that's not true. The statistics can't back it up. The FBI did not make the distinction of, well, we're gonna make this other category. Wouldn't you make that category? So there's a lot of things like that. When you think about the clerical and paperwork side of law enforcement and the, and the reporting side of all the data and everything like that, the ATF doesn't have a ground to, to stand on when they're the ones that approve these things from the very get-go. Obama's ATF could have easily said no from the very beginning, but they didn't. And they allowed these braces to be out there and, and get into the wild for this period of 10 or 12 years. And now what we wind up running into is the braces are now in common use. So there are a lot of things to consider with this Fifth uh, Circuit decision that now has a nationwide injunction because... And the injunction basically means that the government cannot, the ATF cannot enforce this new rule that they came up with. Right. So it's illegal for them to do anything with it. Right. It, you know, it's been, it's been proven that irreparable harm will come to uh, anyone that owns a brace pistol in terms of the compliance. Like, they're going to be out hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in order to comply. So there are financial repercussions, right? There are legal repercussions in terms of, you know, hey, what about Joe Blow that doesn't keep his ear to the ground on everything that's going on in the 2A world? And you went to Walmart or wherever, or that's probably a bad example, but you went to your local gun shop 
and bought a braced pistol with a factory brace on it. And the guy at the gun store sold it to you and it was all good. And all you know is, hey, cool. Like the guy at the gun store sold it to me. So it must be legit. Like it's, yeah, it was Yeah, did a illegal. background check and everything. Right, you did a background check. So what? Now you're going to be riding along, minding your own business. And you're going to get pulled over by the police. And they're going to find it. And now you're all of a sudden a felon and you didn't know. So see, the burden of proof in terms of what they have to, to prove uh, of you and, and your intentions of owning that particular type of gun or whatever, it's like that there's so much irreparable harm that can be caused to you um, through this. And it also goes against the Administrative Procedures Act as well. So there's a lot of reasoning that they give in some of the detailed dissertations uh, that the Fifth Circuit put out in terms of their reasoning for why they had to you know, have this nationwide injunction. Now, we do expect the ATF to fight this in court because, of course, they have unlimited money. Uh, they can just print money with a little machine, right? Like, they don't care uh, how, how long it takes or how long they drag the it out. budgets are unlimited. They basically. have an unlimited budget. And they also have the political winds in their sails uh, to, to get everything they want in this matter, right? They have the full backing of the current government at the highest level uh, to attack all of us and try to turn us into felons overnight. Uh, you know, I think there, I forget the name of the gentleman that, that made this particular statement. But it was one of the people from the Russian KGB. And he basically ended up saying, hey, you know, when it comes to how are we going to nail this guy, right? Well, if you show me, you, you show me the man, I'll show you the crime. So this isn't about like, well, someone broke the law and now, you know, it's a, it's a cause and effect type situation. No, what they're doing now is they're going, well, here's this pool of people. Here's this 10 million, 12 million you mentioned, or let's just say upwards of several million people that own these devices. Like, ooh, here's a big dragnet we can throw out. And if we just say all these people are now illegal, so see now, they're, they're, there's the men, there's the, there's the 12 million men. All right, now let's make the crime. So see, that's the issue. It goes completely against our checks and balances. Like none of this went through Congress. This is not a law. This is just someone's bad opinion that carries the weight of law. And that is the issue. And part of the Fifth Circuit's determination on this injunction is that the enforcement is going to cause absolute irreparable harm to many people. I mean, I think it's safe to say a $100,000 fine, 10 years in prison, upward to including potentially them coming and shooting your dog and, and kicking in your door in the middle of the night. I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty severe an penalty. Make out of you. Right, that's a severe penalty, right? So um, anything that involves law enforcement and the potential for death or harm or dismemberment or, or, or heavy fines or the loss of your freedom, it would seem obviously quite uh, important that those types of decisions need to be made through Congress. So if something's going to have that type of heavy enforcement action taken against it, uh, especially if it involves your freedom, like your literal freedom, your life, you know, if it's going to involve that, I think it's at least important that the people have a say and that your that your representatives have a say in that. Because you know, we have an elected government, you know, like our government or re elected representatives that are there to represent us and to take our grievances to, to heart in terms of this. So when you have unelected bureaucrats in, a, in, a, in an alphabet agency that can just swipe a pen and go, well, Daddy Biden said this is so, and then here's the rule, and we're going to treat it like it's the law. That's not, how this, that's not the intention of how we are meant to run this country. It completely negates the checks and balances that, that, that define the very way that our country operates. Well, this whole thing started, what was it, a year, year and a half ago when I remember reading about this and they said, well, you got like 90 days or there, there was a, I don't know, I can't remember what the window was, like 90 days or six months, they said, this is our grace period. If you've got one of these pistol braced weapons, then register it and, you know, we'll forgive you. And then I saw some of the attorneys that are saying, if you send your pictures in and your documentation, you're basically saying, I did this. That's an admission I, of guilt. Yeah, exactly. And so what about all those, I would imagine some people complied with that. And so now right. they've basically put themselves in, in legal jeopardy, I would think. Well, there are, think about all these people that have come out now and said, well, now that this injunction is nationwide and everything like that, how many people have I seen that have said, I got a free SBR out of the deal? Ha, see, well, I, I didn't have to pay $200. I got a free SBR through this. So, you know, the joke's on them. Well, yeah, see, the rat thinks the cheese is free. Cheese ain't free. The cheese ain't free. It's in that trap for a reason. Okay. Every rat thinks the cheese is free. There's no such thing as free. If something's free, you're the product. 
That's true. It's like Facebook. Yes. <laughs> You're the product, baby. You know, and that that's the thing. Like, if they dangle that carrot and say, well, you can get a free SBR. Well, yeah, I can also tell you that I had an illegal SBR by saying, by admitting that and sending you pictures of it. Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. How about not? My recommendation always from day one was to tell people to just be low-key about it, ignore it, and it's all going to sort out in the long run. And we knew from day one that this wasn't going to hold water. We knew it. But so, of course, you have to go through the check. You have to go through the motions. That's what this all comes down to. It's always, you know, a legal game of cat and mouse. Yeah, because under under normal circumstances, you look at what you know the people on the left are always attacking is the NRA. But quite frankly, over the last several years, I don't. The NRA is never involved in any of these things. It's like they're not doing anything to go after this kind of stuff and supposedly stand up for the gun rights of Americans, even though that's why they exist it seems like they're most of the executive staff and the politics i mean i'm a lifetime nra member but it just seems like it's a, most of the money is just spent by the people that run it and they're really not doing anything to help keep our gun rights from being infringed on this and so you got firearms Co policy coalition we've got the gun owners of america that you're involved in and then there was the second amendment um foundation so foundation SAF. and so all these three groups are actually spending money and legislating and going after the government and suing them in court and so like in this case the fifth circuit has just said you know you you cannot enforce this and so what's the process now is the atf working to to appeal this and who are they going to appeal it to and how many more levels can they go before they get to the Supreme Court and they go, they just throw it back to the lower courts and say, hey, Bruin, come on. Well, you know, the difficulty in this is that getting a gun case to the Supreme Court is not quite so easy, right? You know, it's a highly politicized type of an idea gun ownership is, and it shouldn't be politicized. It's our right. Is the freedom of speech politicized in any way? I mean, if you think about your rights in terms of a grocery store list, okay, think about this. We're the founding fathers, and we're sitting around a fire-lit chamber, and we go, all right, let's make a list. What, what's important, right? What, what do we want to tell, tell the king, F you, this is not, you know, you know we're not going to touch these things. These are, these are sacred to us. Well, think about that grocery store list. What's at the top of the list? Milk, bread, like the things you don't want to forget, you're going to put at the top of the list as being most important because you don't want to forget it. And the things at the top of the list are the building blocks of everything else on the grocery list. I can't make a, I don't need to buy jelly or bologna or cheese if I don't have bread, right? So that's the same thing with our, our rights. Okay, you know, freedom of speech, boom, number one, put that at the top. Well, what if, what if people are put in an environment where they can't protect, what, how are they going to protect what they say? If we have the freedom of speech, but what does the freedom of speech mean if we can't defend what we say? Well, then when we need to have guns, we have the right to bear arms. Okay, so see, those things are are so resolute in of each, in each other for that reason. They they support each other. They are the literal fangs. If you got a whole mouthful of teeth, the first and second amendment are the largest, most gnarly teeth that have the most power to bite. You know, and that's the way we have to look at it. Now, the ATF, yeah, they're going to try to throw this up, uh, maybe to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will they take this case? Well, um, you know, they have shown some you know, some willingness to want to hear more uh, gun cases in the Supreme Court. I believe it was Kavanaugh, if I'm not mistaken, that said, hey, you know, the Second Amendment has always been treated like a second-rate right, and, the, and, and I want to see the court hear more Second Amendment cases. I mean, when you break down all of the Supreme Court cases um, and, ha and what type of things have been um, heard by the Supreme Court, I mean, I don't want to give exact numbers off the top of my head, of course. I don't have the information in front of me, but you're talking – Hundreds, if not thousands, of First Amendment-related uh, things have been heard by the Supreme Court. Fourth Amendment things, all these other types, of Fifth Amendment things. But how few cases have actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court in regards to the Second Amendment and been, you know, heard our way? And you know, that's a pretty short list. So I think we're long overdue for a situation where, okay, fine, ATF, you want to take this further? Go ahead. Appeal it. Let's go to the Supreme Court. So the only place to go from the Fifth Circuit Court is to the Supreme Court. I believe so. Yeah. So the so ATF, we, if they're going to try to fight that, they're going to have to go to the Supreme right. Court. Now, the Supreme Court could shoot it back down to the lower court. You know, they could just say, hey, mm, we don't want to hear this. I mean, just because there's some crazy issue that we're like, wow, we want to take this to you the lower court. Say, yeah, let's be take this to the Supreme Court. Sending it back court. to the Fifth Circuit? Right. 
So right back to the judges that already said you can't enforce this. Right. Right. But but at the but that's still, you know, some sort of a victory, right? If if we know that wherever it lands, it's gonna be shot down, well then then that gives us what we want. I mean and how I, long is there like a moratorium? How long can like say, oh well we'll just wait out till we get a few different Supremes in there and then we'll appeal it. Does that mean like ten years from now they can go try to appeal that? You know, I that's a good question, Corey, and I'm not going to claim I'm not a lawyer. So I, I, I'm just a guy that I, I try to kind of have my 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 ear to the ground and sort of process all of this in a way that I can try to explain it to to people that make sense to them. Um, I don't really understand the legalese at that level. Uh, I can get that answer for you. Um, however, one thing that I would say about this whole process, though, is that I think there's never been a, a, a better time right now for. Um, for the Supreme Court to hear Second Amendment related cases, right? Like we know that in the uh, in the Michael Cargill case uh, with bump stocks, that is going to the Supreme Court, right? And we're going to see That's some gonna be injunctive relief. Oh yeah, I don't see how that is going to not get thrown out, right? So see, if bump stocks get thrown out, well then by proxy, so because that was every Trump that other, banned those, right? The opposing Trump, Republican Trump used the power of the pen to ban bump stocks. We have to call that for what it is, but. If we know that if any one Both of those sons things, are very pro gun, any one of those things make it to the Supreme Court and get thrown out, and the Supreme Court says, "Hey, you can't abuse the power of the pen to bypass Congress, especially in an enforcement area that involves people's freedom." All right, we know that's the case. We know that's true, but until the Supreme Court says it, until it's in black and white, um, you know. All right, so say that the bump stock uh, case gets thrown out in the Supreme Court, and they go, "Hey, you, you can't do this. It's unlawful." Well, then by proxy, that also means that any other power of the pen that's been used to abuse Chevron deference, right, that those also must be by proxy somehow illegal too, like the frame and receiver rule, the brace rule, um, any other type of ban where the president says, well, I'm going to use the power of the pen uh, to uh, press this administrative agency to carry out enforcement action based on my political whims that happen to go against the Constitution and, and the rights of the people. So, you know, it's a long-term battle. It's an uphill battle, but I think it's a battle that we're actually winning. Like, you know, the, the district courts are handing out some doozies, and the Supreme Court is handing out some doozies. Like, with the New York State and Rifle Pistol Association uh, versus Bruin, like, we see that the Bruin case gave us some great relief. It gave us a great smell test that the federal government has to adhere to in order to justify their reasoning for gun laws, right? You know, they have to provide some historical context and reference to laws that existed in 1791 at the time of the, you know, well, at least at the time the Second Amendment was was drafted in 1791. They've got to be able to go back to 1791 and say, hey, at this time, this is why this gun control now is valid because we had a historical analog from back then that says, hey, this is what we did originally so that's what Bruin does. It provides that smell test. The, the burden of proof is now on the government to prove that their gun control, that they are, you know, even gun control that's already passed, the NFA, uh, GCA, all these other rules that we have to follow, that, that we've allowed these things to propagate, right? We've, we've allowed even groups like the NRA to actually have a say in, like, how these gun control laws are written, like, like they help write the NFA. They help write, you know, write these bills. So it's like, when we look at that, it's like, we're having to live under this. We're having to be subject to it, right? You know, we're having to go out of our way and, and allow ourselves to be subject to these laws. But Bruin changes that. Bruin puts it into a perspective where, you know, they're going to have to, they're going to have to dig deeper and, and prove historical analog, you know, text, traditions, historical analogs, for uh, gun control that was of the same type of, of, of type that we have now. All right, show me a law in 1791 that says you can't have a short rifle or a short shotgun or a short pistol or, or, or in fact, a law in 1791 that, uh, that, that banned or, or, or regulated any type of firearm. You could have a warship in 1791. You could get your privateer, sign off as a privateer and buy a warship with cannons and grape shot and <laughs> go out and be a, pri a private pirate for the United States government at the time if you wanted to. You could buy a whole warship and hire a crew and run your own private warship. So let, <laughs> let's discuss then the uh, NFA Act and because, you know, I've been reading, there's a lot of talk about that, that that's going to get overturned. So can you talk about 
what legal cases are, are out there, what the NFA Act is, obviously suppressors, short barrel rifles, machine guns, things of that nature. Give us a little The NFA was, you know, really what the NFA was, a, it was a reaction to a lot of things that were going on in our country at the time, okay? And when we look at the NFA, and you're, at, you're talking about, hey, what court cases are kind of floating around right now that sort of, you know, point a bullseye on top of the NFA? Well, we're seeing that, right? The bump stock uh, case, the brace situation, the frame and receiver rule. All of these things are the saber rattling of what will eventually become a complete dismantling of the NFA if things continue, if these doozies begin to keep getting handed down in the courts that we're seeing. That what it really winds up pointing to is all of those little rivers trickle into what will be the end of the NFA, right? Because though all these things are covered under the NFA, and that the was NFA. in reaction to the gangsters mowing each other down, right? Yeah. Guns. So, yeah. So you had you had gangsters killing each other and using machine guns, and you could you could order machine guns through a department store, right? You know, you could just pick up a Sears catalog and I want a Thompson and they could deliver it to your front door. Like it, you know, it was pretty easy to get machine guns. It was like a hammer or a screwdriver, a pair of scissors. It's there are shears. My grandpa used to tell me stories of how his dad would send him to the hardware store with money, right? To go buy a case of dynamite to blow stumps up on the property. (laughs) And I remember I was cleaning up in my grandpa's shop sometime back. And I remember, you know, I'm cleaning up and I found this box in the corner and sure enough, it was a dynamite box. Now, of course, all the dynamite was gone. But that box was, and I was thinking, my grandpa went to the hardware store and bought that box of dynamite way, way, way back when and kept that box all those years. And I still have that box of dynamite. Well, not the dynamite inside, of course. If you're listening to ATF, I don't have a box of dynamite. I just have the box the dynamite came in. But it just It's a historical artifact. That, yeah, but back then, you could just... Send Junior down to the harbor. That dynamite store would would not be to be dangerous to handle. Dynamite and at a this bunch point, of right? a bunch of Thompsons, you know, in cases of ammo and whatever. So the NFA was was a reaction to really what what the NFA really was at this core level was that the government saw that their power system was being threatened by other powerful people within the community who just happened to you know they realized that their monopoly on violence was at an end. If you've got all these gangsters out here that could have all the machine guns that you have, if not, probably better equipped than the law enforcement was at the time. Because, you know, you've got private money. You know, these gangsters are running these very elaborate criminal operations, making gobs and gobs of money, not to mention hiding that money quite well so the feds could not get their hands on anything, right? They saw that as a threat to their power. If we're really getting at the core level of why the NFA became to be, that's really why. Because they wanted to control the criminal enterprise that those guns was fueling, not necessarily. The guns were a moot point. The guns were almost secondary, right? The guns were just that dog whistle that they could go, hey, well, if we we have the NFA and we regulate these machine guns, well, then maybe these criminals will kind of take a step back in their criminal, criminal enterprise and do less. You know, hey, we'll... We'll go after them hard financially. We'll arrest them. Like, you know, they're going to do whatever they need to do to seek those people out and remove their power. That's what they were really concerned about was all of these, the power that these guys had. Like, they could buy off police commissioners. They could buy off the police. They could buy off courts. Like, they had literal power. They were movers and shakers, and the feds hated that. They were scared of the idea that there was a lateral group of, of a lateral ladder of power within society that could get things done at the level that they did. So they viewed it as a power struggle more than anything else. The NFA was a way for them to go, okay, cool. We can go after these things and we can regulate them to the point that, you know, okay, people can buy these items still, but now we'll know who's buying them. So like they really just wanted to identify like the types of people that were getting into these in these sorts of guns. And so then they figure, well, if it's all above ground now, we know who's buying them. They're all registered. It's like it's really just about registering the people more than it is the guns are irrelevant. Which guns that someone had doesn't really matter. It's just having the list of people that you know wants and to buy when, those. When was that guns. act passed? 1934. 1934. And then at some point the the suppressors became part of that, or was how did um, that all happen? You know, I'm not going to speculate off the top of my head because I know that they they did have. I think there was a revision to the NFA later on. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit there and try to, to spout off a, a bunch of information about that w- without having it in front of me. However, at its core level, I'll get back to like the core level of of the NFA. 
the point, yes, was to regulate specific types of firearms that they felt were a threat. They, of course, say, oh, a threat to people. Now, is that to say that that these guns that were being used in crimes, okay, if you're at the bank minding your own business and some criminal comes in and robs a bank and sprays a machine gun, I mean, yeah, I'm sure that's, yeah, that's kind of dangerous. Like, you don't want to have an innocent bystander get hurt. And I'm sure there's plenty of situations where people were blown up or, or shot or hurt by these criminal activity and things that were going on. So they viewed it as a public interest for them to try to do something to have a, a more regulation on these types of items for what they viewed as a public good or public safety. Of course, they're always going to say in the guise of public safety. Yeah, we're going to protect you. Keep short-barreled you shotguns, short-barreled rifles of certain lengths, you know, um, machine guns and automatic sawed off shotguns, sawed off shotguns. And those are all the kind of things they were encountering in in these organized crime and things like that. Um, and of course, suppressors, I don't know if suppressors were on there initially or if they got came later, but of course the NFA wound up covering, um, suppressors and things like that as well. So when the law was passed and we say 34, Mm -hmm. What was the net effect on, like, if you still want to get a Thompson submachine gun? What, what, what was the process then? You, before, you could just go to the hardware store and, and buy one. And what right. happened after that? Yeah, so I think, I think that date that we're looking for was, like, around 86 when they, when they changed things uh, to make it where, the, where civilians could not buy a newly well, produced they, machine gun anymore. So in 34, okay, what did right, that do, so the NFA passes, all right, 1934 or whatever. All right, you want to buy a Thompson, whatever, you would pay a $200 tax stamp. So they set the tax stamp at $200, which in 1934... That's a lot of money. Oh, That's thousands yes. of dollars. In 1934, that was a pile of money. You could buy a, what was a Ford Model T, I think was originally like 500 bucks. Right. So $200 is Half the a cost pile of, a car. of money. Yeah, so like in today's money, that's probably a better part of what, three or four grand or something. Like it's a lot of money now, you know? Uh, nineteen thirty-four dollars versus now. I'm not going to try to do the conversion or figure it, but definitely not a small sum of money in nineteen thirty-four. But they fixed the tax stamp price at two hundred dollars. So if you want to buy a Thompson submachine gun, you could, but it's two hundred bucks. It would cost two hundred dollars, which was top, probably way more than what the gun cost. On top Guns like of thirty the cost, bucks or something, then right on top of the cost of the Thompson. I mean, I think you could buy a Thompson for like sixty-five dollars or eighty-five dollars. You know, it's like. You know, so you got two hundred eighty-five dollars. Well, really, you're getting extorted into the idea of you're paying three times what the gun is worth to simply have the privilege of owning the gun in the first place. And that they figured, I think, that well, if we make the tax stamp some exuberant sum of money, well, then only these gangsters will be the ones that can afford it because they won't care. What's the? They got plenty of money. They figure well. If some regular person out in society doesn't want to own the, you know, they're not going to spend two hundred dollars on a tax stamp to own this sort of thing because you know most. And back then they probably thought, well, most average people don't really care to own a machine gun anyway, so it won't affect them anyway. Maybe that was their thinking. They were. It was rather innocuous in that sense. They were trying to throw out a dragnet to bring in these criminals and and to try to kind of. So they figure if, if the the tax stamp, then they know who the gangsters are that are buying the guns. Maybe. I think that that's a logical outgrowth and a logical outcrop of maybe what they were thinking, uh, and, and maybe that maybe that ended up being true for them. But it was a different time back then. I mean, you're talking almost a hundred years ago, so it was a very different time back then. Um, so with that, yes, all right. So the NFA came through in '34. Well, yeah, if you wanted to buy a machine gun, you could still buy whatever gun you wanted to have. You just had to pay the additional two hundred dollar tax stamp. Could you still order it through the Sears catalog and just pay the... I'm pretty sure you could, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you could still... It's just, every, they made everything more expensive. Yes, And it course. gave the government a way to find out who was actually purchasing yes. it, whereas before, anybody could walk in and buy it. No, and then in 86... Go back and check nothing. In 86, that's when they made it to where you could no longer purchase newly made machine guns as an individual, as a regular citizen anymore. So that's when they really put a stop to it completely, right? So now anything that is was made before 86 is a transferable machine gun that was on the registry that, you know, between 34 and 86, whatever was on that registry, they're in private hands or in collections. You know, people have the tax stamp, they have the gun, whatever, and there's a finite amount of them, right? There's never going to be any more made, right? So if, let's say, for instance, in 86, if they wouldn't have said, okay, no more newly manufactured machine guns for civilians. Like, you can't pay the $200 tax stamp and buy a machine gun anymore and just have it registered. That was simply was not good enough for them. They're like, no, we won't allow any new ones. Only previously 
registered ones are able to be transferred. So now we have what's called like the transferable pool or like a, what we call a transferable machine gun. So anything made before or, or made from 34 to 86 in that time frame that was registered is transferable. So let's say that, for instance, my grandpa owned a Browning automatic rifle, okay, on the registry, a full auto Browning, and then left it to me and I paid the tax stamp. And I think they might even have some things in place to where like if it's a, if you're, you can, you can have the tax stamp moved over to you, like if a loved one passes away, and I don't think you have to pay. I think they just, you know, change the name on it or whatever. I'm not going to get into that. The point is, though, let's say you wound up with Grandpa's old bar or whatever. Well, he might have paid, you know, $100 for that thing back in the day or something and registered it like he was supposed to or whatever. But then now, I mean, that bar is worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars oh, because it's on the register. 25, 30 grand at a yeah. minimum? you're talking a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 gun because they're not making any more of them. You can't just, we couldn't have a company just decide to make brand new produced Browning automatic rifles, just like the World War II ones, and then make them newly produced for today's consumer because the 86 ban prevents that from occurring. So that's why this now becomes a strict supply and demand issue. There are so many. There are only so, so in 86, many. So in '86, it was Congress passed a law that said no more new machine guns. You can only own ones that are pre-1986 that are registered with us already. Right. In '68, they had the Gun Control Act, and then '86, that was like the crime bill that like that, that prevented that. There's so many different ones. I hope I didn't, I didn't get that wrong, but it, well, I know it was in '86. So the point is, is that. Like in 86. That's 100 years of infringements. Initially yes. starts out, you know, we got all these gangsters buying these, you know, we'll charge extra money. Yeah. You're not prevented from owning them, but we're going to know who actually has them right. because these gangsters, it's kind of like the way, the way Chicago is now where you get the gang members just, you know, emptying magazines that eat each other in the street. And yeah, not a lot's changed. <laughs> hitting each other sometimes, but more often than not, hitting some kid that's playing yeah. with Legos in their bedroom because the bullet goes through the window or the wall or whatever. That's right. So it winds up being a supply and demand issue. So if, let's say there, I'm just going to use this this number. This isn't a real number, but let's just say, let's say there's 100 Browning automatic rifles on the registry. Then that means that there's only going to be 100 ever. Like, that's it. Whatever's on the registry is there. So in terms of the NFA, that's why NFA items are so expensive. That's why you see M16s that are $50,000. You see, you know, MAC-10, like a, a MAC-10 machine gun that should only be a $500 gun. Like, literally, it shouldn't cost over 1000 bucks. They're cheap to make. Yeah, they're ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, depending on the condition, for a gun that is not even worth the grand. But it's supply and demand because there's only so many on the registry. It's a finite commodity with an unlimited demand. So that's why that transferable pool is so valuable and continues to be val valuable. And here's the thing. There's a subset of gun owners out there that own a lot of transferable machine guns that don't want the laws to change. Because if the laws change and, and all this is open back up, well, now their collections aren't going to be worth anything. Yep. If you can newly produce all these guns and people can just simply pay a $200 tax stamp and just on top of the cost of the normal gun... For instance, a Colt Sporter, like, I don't know, like an XM-177 or an M4, let's just say an M4 Colt, like a regular old Colt. To make that gun full auto and make it a machine gun versus a semi-auto is like $35 worth of extra parts and maybe an extra, you know, 45 minutes worth of machine time to cut the pocket. That's just a matter of programming the, the, CD, the CNC to... <laughs> you know, to cut the correct pocket and to drill the correct hole. But like, it's no more expensive to put the auto sear. It's like a marginal amount of money more to make it a, a machine gun than it is to make it a semi-auto, right? And they cost the same. So if the NFA didn't exist, you, you would be able to go into a gun store and buy a 14-inch barrel Colt M4 with an auto sear in it for a thousand bucks. Machine gun. And that's the way it should be. So Interesting. I believe strongly in the ability of civilians to be able to have whatever firearms the military has. I mean, when we look at the Second Amendment to keep and bear arms, right? When we look at, you know, when we look at that right, I mean, when we say a well-regulated militia, right? People go, oh, well, it means regulated. It means that we should have laws that, that regulate these items. That's what they mean. 
But that's not true. To regulate means to keep in order, to keep in good repair, to keep ready. The constitutional language regulate means to keep in order. Like if I take my scope and I adjust my scope to hit where I want it, want it to hit, I am regulating that optic. That's what the language means. Well-regulated means well-kept, in order, ready, capable. That's what it means. And people have somehow gotten it all spun up to go, oh, they always go back to that, well, a militia means it should only be the military. Well, that's not true. Who are the militia? The militia is every able-bodied person that can carry a damn gun. I think it was Patrick Henry Lee. <laughs> he said, who are the militia? The militia are, in fact, the people themselves and include all men capable of bearing arms. That's right. The idea was that when the, the you know, because we're, we're a constitutional republic of 50 individual countries. And so obviously I live in Florida, Eric lives in Georgia. And so if Daddy DeSantis decided to call up the militia, all able-bodied males, and what came down in the ruling that Scalia ruled on originally, it's when you get called off for militia duty, you are expected to bring your pistols, your rifles, your cannons, or your puckle gun, which was their version of the <laughs> machine gun, to your militia duty. You're supposed to be armed, safe, and competent with firearms when you show up. And so, they, you know, they, they wanted the whole body of the American people to be armed for that purpose so they could draw from the population at large that everybody could serve in militia duty. And most people don't know that. The founding fathers used the words. And the other thing with the Second Amendment, it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It did not say the right of the government or the right of the military. It said the right of the people. Who are the people? The people are all of us. It means all American citizens. The militia is the people. Yep. It defines when you look at the language, the constitutional language of the Second Amendment is extremely clear. It's the most clear constitutional language, I would argue, in the entire document. It's very clear in what it means. It's very concise. It's very carefully written for a reason. Now, if we could go in a time machine and go back, we'd probably tell them, hey, y'all need to be a little more <laughs> clear, maybe. Like, let's, let's really for the make people this in the back. beyond a shadow of a doubt here. Like, no, no, you want to add this. Like, hey, there's going to be these things called machine guns. You need to probably add that. Like, hey, check this out. Like, could you well, imagine they had if George guns Washington. Back then, but they chose <laughs> not to buy them or use them because they were cumbersome, they were extremely heavy, and they really weren't, weren't practical. And so it was, it was determined that it was better to spend their money and their limited resources in pistols and rifles or the muskets, right. if you will. Yeah, and Washington, what's, what's crazy back then, too, is that you know, Washington would always tell his men to load buck and ball. So a lot of people don't know this, that a lot of the troops back then would load like not only the, the, the musket ball, but also shot like buckshot as well, and they called it buck and ball. And it would increase their chances of getting a, a hit on the enemy. So Washington would always tell his troops to low buck and ball, especially ones that were close to him. Because think about it, like, it's a close-range weapon. Like, why not have more projectiles? And, you know, that was something that was kind of like a throwback, you know, to some of the things that, that they had learned fighting Indians and stuff, you know. So they, they took that, that knowledge and, you know, put it right back into the Revolutionary War. But it's just interesting to think that, that tactics will always trump equipment. And they, they, they employed good tactics. You know, they were motivated. They were defending their land. And when we look at the spirit of the it Second Amendment— It was life or death. It's like, right. you know, if they didn't win, they were all dead. Yes. And their families would be dead as well. That's right. Because the British would come in and burn your farm down and— kill your whole family. They didn't care because to them, you were rebelling against the king, which was the supreme authority, the divine right of kings, if you will. That's right. That's right. But, you know, the, the Second Amendment is a precious, precious right. And it's very important. And, you know, we, we should all, you know, regardless of what we believe, we, sh we should all really de defend that right and protect that right. Even even people we don't agree with. Like, are there people that, that I wish wouldn't own a gun? I mean, yeah, there's probably like really evil people. Yeah, I wish violent criminals wouldn't have guns. Of course, I, I don't want violent criminals to have guns. But at its holistic level, that's not what it says, right? It gives us the ability to protect ourselves against anyone that would hurt us, whether it's our own people, whether it's the government, whether it's each other. It gives everyone equal footing an equal chance, right? 
the gun gun rights don't care if you're black or white, if you're rich or poor, doesn't care what your place in society is. You you could have a rich father, you could have a poor father, you could be anywhere in society. You could be weak, you could be strong, you could be fat, you could be skinny, and it doesn't matter. When you have a firearm, everyone's equal. And that's what the that's what the founding fathers wanted the most with the Second Amendment is for all men to be equal. Yeah, Americans are the equals of their government. The government is just our representatives. They're supposed to represent us, not lord over us. We're not their subjects. We're not meant We're to be not ruled. their property. Right. They are equals. They're just simply our fucking clerks. And most of them are doing a pretty shitty job. I think most people would agree. I agree. I agree. They're doing an incredibly dismal job. And, you know, the Second Amendment is meant to be that check and balance that if all else fails... That's the one thing we can always lean back on. And that's a very uncomfortable conversation for people to have. They don't want to accept that their life could be uncomfortable. That things, that the entire world that they know, it could be turned upside down. I mean, look, many of our founding fathers, Corey, died penniless, right? They, they lost their families in the war. They lost their friends in the war. They lost all their money, their fortunes. They gave up everything. They lost body parts and limbs and eyes and they gave up everything up to including their lives for what they believed in and when we look at that at its at its whole core level you know that founding father that might have been on their deathbed and thinking was all this worth it you know what losing my family losing my farm losing my livelihood dying penniless but you know what i bet their heart was full because they knew that what was at stake if they lost they knew that the country they were trying to build what was required Something the, the greater sacrifices than themselves. that were required yeah greater than themselves and that's who we are as people that's who we are as a country as americans we're people that value something greater than ourselves and we've forgotten that as a society we've really we've really str- you know gotten away from that we've strayed away from what made us really really good in the first place was on purpose that's right unfortunately our elite that's it. The Bill Gateses of the world, the uh, Larry Finks of the world, that, you know, Bill Gates, Mr. Man Boobs himself, thinks that, <laughs> you know, the rest of us need to live the way he wants us to live. It's like... Or I'm not going to trust somebody that looks like that and tell me how to live. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you elitesy bugs! Yeah. <laughs> so back to the uh, the NFA Act, um, what... So you're... Are there any... Um, Court cases that these organizations, whether it's Firearms Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America, or Second Amendment Foundation, are involved in that are specifically going after the NFA Act? Or is it just all of these other cases like the, the pistol brace and some of the other one and the, the, um, the bump stock one? I think right now it's more of a tentacle effect to where all of those kind of trickles lead back to the NFA in its entirety. If we if we treat the NFA like it's this um, giant monster, right, with a bunch of gnashing teeth and tentacles and multiple heads, well, you don't just try to go right for the body because then all the tentacles are going to grab you. Each head's going to bite you. Like you're going to lop off a little bit here and there. You know, we're gonna we're gonna slice off this tentacle and then slice off that tentacle and then slice off that head and eventually the beast dies. And I think that's the overall plan. Going after the NFA in its entirety, I, I believe, has been, you know, talked about and tried over the years. And I, I think it, there's a, there's some weird legalese that I'm not going to get into that that kind of have made it difficult um, to go after from a legal perspective in, in, in court and everything. But Bruin does change that landscape. And I do think that that tentacle effect is what is ultimately going to, you know, really get us towards getting in a complete abolishing of the NFA is to essentially render everything the NFA regulates um, as being completely unconstitutional. So if the NFA regulates, let's say, short-barreled rifles, okay, and we determine that a brace doesn't make a pistol a rifle, and because of common use, this is all moot point. Like, what's the point of having the NFA and having short-barreled rifle laws when there's no distinction between a short-barreled rifle and a pistol with a brace? And pistols with braces are in common use, therefore are protected by the Second Amendment. But then further, Bruin establishes the precedent that if there were no regulations in 1791 that regulated the length of a firearm, then the whole NFA is a moot point to begin with anyway. So Bruin changes the landscape, changes the rules so that we can challenge aspects of the NFA, which will begin as mere aspects of the NFA, which will eventually become, hey, like 
we're challenging the validity of this whole thing. Like, get the hell out of here. Like, y'all can't do this just because uh, 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 infringement has been long standing. Like, NFA's been here since 34. Just because that's existed for that amount of time doesn't make it right. Doesn't mean that it's okay. It just means that people have accepted it as the reality for so long because it's all they've ever known. And up until recently, you know, the NRA was really the only organization that supposedly was supposed to, to do something about these laws. They'd never been challenged. And, you know, it's one of the interesting asides from that is you, you know, you hear a lot of talk about George Soros and these prosecutors that he's gotten elected. He realized, and Elon Musk was talking about this recently, that Soros realized that it's really hard to get laws changed and passed. So if you elect far left leading prosecutors that basically will just not enforce the law, you've basically accomplished the same goal to where, you know, like we had one of them in, I think it was Orlando. It was uh, a uh, attorney uh, general that DeSantis removed from office because she was selectively enforcing the law. And so he kicked her ass out of office. And this was somebody that Soros had helped to get elected. And so when he looked at the amount of money that he had to spend to help these left-leaning prosecutors get elected, it was you know a lot of bang for his his buck, so to speak, and it's you know caused havoc in San Francisco, in L.A., yeah. New York, Chicago, where you know these these prosecutors just they just selectively determine you know they don't apply the law equally, and the thing that's on the outside the Supreme Court building on the roof that faces the, you know, the steps, it says equal justice under law. And I would, you know, when you look at the stats, most Americans feel that whether it's BLM or people on the right or the libertarians, most Americans do not feel that there is equal justice under law. It's pretty obvious that the elite seem to get away with everything and the rest of us are always, you know, fighting for scraps basically. We clearly live under a two-tier justice system. And, and I, I don't think there's a person worth their salt that will sit there and say that there's anything but that. It is clearly a two-tier justice system where certain people can get away with whatever they want and certain people can't. It's because they're well, well connected. You look at the, all the stuff with the Russiagate nonsense and you have, um, what's his name, Andy McCabe, who is the deputy director of the FBI, and he's a Democrat. And his wife was running for Senate, and she got a nice big donation from Hillary Clinton's, one of her political action committees, her PACs, made a nice donation to her Senate campaign, which she ultimately ended up losing. But the other thing is that Annie McCabe was also put in charge of the email investigation. And so if Hillary Clinton has given your wife a bunch of money to help her get elected, even though she didn't get elected, she lost her election. And you're looking at her her emails. Hillary does you a solid, and you're going to return that favor. Exactly. And you know, so you look at things like that, and obviously all the, all that stuff ended up coming out. And so Comey, um, Andy McCabe, Peter Strzok, the lovely Lisa Page. And probably about a dozen other people that were all involved in all that crap, they got identified and they all got booted out of out of government. Andy McCabe got got fired because he also lied, but he didn't get prosecuted, even though he did things that other people in government have done, and they're in prison for it, and nothing happened to him at all. And it's because he's part of the club, because he's rubbing elbows with the right people, and it's you know, your political appointees that are the upper echelons of the, the head shed and all of yeah. our, our different agencies, this is what happens. And so the rank and file people, they have no power because they're, they're lower, lower down in the food chain and they don't have any power. They know this shit's going on. It's upsetting to them, but what can they do? But, yeah. you know, in that case, you had dirty cops and they got identified and they got booted out of office. And so they're no longer in office in those agencies causing problems, they're now working for CNN and propagandizing us with their BS and nonsense. That's right. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it gets to a point when you have to look at society from a bird's eye level, Corey, and you wind up having to say, you know, it kind of feels like 
this whole thing is being ran like an organized crime syndicate, almost like a giant mafia. Like the government almost just has this air of being a giant mafia. I mean, think about it. You pay taxes, protection money. You pay taxes so they won't come kill you, which is nothing more than protection money. That's what that's something a mafia would do. Or take they manipulate stuff. the currency, right? So if my grandfather gave me a hundred dollars on my sixteenth birthday, that hundred dollars is not going to be worth as much as when my grandpa gave it to me as it is now. I mean, we're taught. We are taught that when you save money, that when you put money back, that that's a smart thing, that, you know, your investment should grow, like your money should grow, you know, that when you do good things like that, you know, it, it, it has good consequences. But, you know, to think that you're punished just because you want to, you know, save currency or save money or work hard and make more money, uh, you wind up being punished. You know, you, you got these people printing money left and right, and it's a hidden tax. This inflation is a hidden tax where... It, when your purchasing power is diminished because these people keep printing money like it's candy, like it's monopoly money, well then, what's the point of being responsible and having money and holding currency and saving money and putting your money in, in the dollar when, when the dollar, the value of the dollar continuously diminishes over and over and over again and to the point where it's like, wow, now it's got 25% of the buying power, 30% of the buying power. It's like, well, what are we doing here? And the hardworking people who have money, who have wanted to put back money and save for the future and try to, you know, essentially put their stock in the dollar as a currency, you know, they're getting slapped in the face by people who are manipulating the currency. And that's very much a type of move a mafia would make, you know. And so you kind of start thinking, gosh, uh, the, the, the government kind of works like organized crime syndicate. And then you go, oh, well, these people get in trouble. These people don't. So there's special privileges and I would argue uh, it's not the government; it's the corrupt people in government it is that we're the unable people. to get rid of. That's the institutions, the as as an institution, you know, are what they are. Yes, it is bad actors within that that larger government. It's like before. little cells of people like Annie McCabe and it James is. Comey and Brennan and Clapper right. and all those little pricks that are working together and know each other. But you've got these people that are, you know, making decisions on these committees. Right, that determine what policies are going to happen. Right, and of course, because they're on these committees, they know what's going to happen before it does. Like, oh, we know a war is coming up. Oh, well, let me go buy some stock and Raytheon and all. You know, Lockheed, Lockheed, and you know, so <laughs> they, they're doing their insider trading. They're doing their grifting. You know, and all the all the while, they're you know trying to raise more money to get reelected, and you know, they're spending their time instead of legislating and actually passing laws and getting any real work done. They spend their whole time raising money to try to get reelected again, so that they can yep. continue to be on these committees and be able to continue to make decisions that they can go, ooh, a little insider baseball. Now they're not supposed to do it, but they do, and it's quite clear. You know, uh, uh, where a junior politician who's only been in in, in, in government for a couple of years. Dan I'm not Crenshaw. Say, well, okay, you said it. Dan Crenshaw <laughs> made millions of dollars in the first couple of years in Congress. And he, his, when he got questioned by, he was like, "How else are we supposed to make money? We got a bills to pay." Well, look, I'm a capitalist just like anybody else, but the, but it, it begins to really make people's faith in the institutions diminish yep. by an exponential margin. Or Nancy Pelosi, which she's Nancy, worth $400 million. When you look at the list of con uh, of congressmen and women that uh, and what they've made and their their earnings, and you've got Nancy Pelosi you know, near the top nice of that list. In the ocean. And when Dan Crenshaw is not too far down that list, you kind of go, really? Really? Money cuts a lot of ties. Really? I mean, I don't hate the guy. I get it. Like, I'm not – look, the truth of the matter is – the I'm not perception, a right, people's <clears throat> perception is what matters in a lot of these situations, okay? So when, when people have the idea that our government's being ran like some giant criminal organization, and when you see people conducting themselves in a manner that is not befitting of a morally and, and logically and, and, and principally sound person that is supposed to be serving, not being served by their 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 position like they're abusing their position for personal gain and and these people go well it's just survival we have to make a living or how else are we going to make a living i get that at that core level sure look i i understand like you know you want to take care of your wife take care of your kids give them a good future i'm not blaming them for you know making a living and and, and doing all those sorts of things but i'm just saying they have to understand look what happened to martha stewart right they had a little to tiny infraction and she went to prison right 
but they have to understand that the ramifications of, of what that does, what that makes society view you as, you have to understand that what you become when you do that. And, and people see that. They're not dumb. They can see that you're making money hand over fist. Like you're taking what, what a Congress makes $176,000 a year or whatever it is. Like, come on. I don't care who you are. You're not, you're not going to, you know, take $176,000 a year and turn it into $4 million. Unless you're playing some insider baseball. 400 million. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 400 Pelosi's million. been there, what, almost yeah, 40 years? Unless you're playing some serious insider baseball. Yeah. This is crazy. And so you begin to, you know, when you look at the two-tier justice system, you think, well, not only is it a two-tier justice system, it's a two-tier financial system. Like it's, oh, these people have access to information you don't have. Like they're playing insider baseball, insider grifting. You know, money laundering. Like you said, Martha Stewart got in trouble for the tiniest little thing. Of course, yeah. And went to jail. And went to jail. But the same thing that maybe she might have done in some little microcosm of a way, they're doing it in some greater macrocosm, and nothing happens to them because of the two-tier justice system. So, see, all of those beasts feed each other and barf into each other's mouths. Yep. And then like all the, the Bidens, what they've been doing for decades. It's yeah. not just Joe Biden. It's his son, Hunter Biden. And his brother, Jim Biden, they've all been working and, and doing corrupt deals and getting Hunter Biden jobs or their other family members' jobs. Buying and, artwork. Yeah. Come on. We know that's money laundering. Yeah. Come Hunter, on. Hunter Biden. Artwork is, is like the, the ultimate money, money laundering operation for the rich. And then he just pays all of his dad's bills. So technically, I don't think that's illegal. You, you're allowed to buy your family stuff, but you know when he's – basically given billions of dollars to to manage for by Chinese elite it's not cuz he's a competent money manager it's obviously a fucking payoff but what happens oh well he's the vice president i if i go after him and i and i don't get him i'm going to lose my career and so the people in the FBI and the other alphabet agencies just look the other way That's right. they don't want to rock the boat they don't want to they jeopardize don't lose their, their career. jobs as you know Andy McCabe well. didn't want to piss off Hillary Clinton That's and a right. lot of people end up dead that go against the Clintons That's right. and their inner circle died under mysterious circumstances. That's highly unusual. Highly un unusual. However, when again, when we go back to that bird's eye level, it's completely explainable if we understand human nature. And again, this all goes back to human nature. You cannot deny human nature. You, you know, someone who's given power will abuse that power. It takes a very special person to be given power and to want to throw away that power like the hot potato that it is. George Washington could have been a king. Yep. They loved that man. They loved George Washington. He was he was they when when his presidency was up, they were like, no, don't leave. Like they love that man to death. And he was like, I will not turn this nation into what we just escaped. I will not trade that king for another king here. No, absolutely not. And he walked away. He relinquished power. It's like and, Lord of the Rings. Yes. You know, precious, you just can't hold on to it That's too right. long. It will corrupt you. That's right. Sometimes you got to pass the ring along. Sometimes you got to throw the fucking ring in the, in the damn volcano. You just have to. And I think we're at a point right now. We're at an impasse in our country where we need to toss the damn ring in the fire. We really do. We need to go back to the real bits and pieces that make us who we are as, as, as a country. We got to get back to God. We got to get back to sound morals and principles, hard work, good work ethic, bringing back manufacturing to our country. I mean, I'm not getting on a political soapbox in that regard. But look, the truth of the matter is, is that there's some corrupt shit going on in this country and people are really getting sick of it. And I think it's getting impossible to deny at this point. It's not mere saber rattling. It is a literal drawing of the sword at this point for a lot of people. There's no turning back. And, and we're at the bleeding of the coffers phase of this, of this country. And remember, at the, in the end of the Roman Empire, what happened? They bled the coffers dry. They spent themselves out of control. They didn't care. They knew. Yeah, they mixed other metals in with their coins. Yeah, they knew that the, that, the, that, the, that the party was ending. They're like, well, we're going to do what we can on the way out. Let's knock everything on the way out. That's what these, these people are acting in a way that would lead you to believe that they don't even think that America has any future anymore. And well, that's an issue. And we're going to sit here and let it happen. 
That's the well, problem. the way most of those guys believe, and even the Bidens obviously seem to believe just because of how they vote and how the policies that they institute is the global elite, if you will, are all trying, and they've been doing this ever since the country was founded, and it's something that goes has been going on all throughout human history. It's the will – there was a quote attributed to Thomas Jefferson. I don't think it was actually him. There was no evidence of it, but he said – this, the question today is the same as it's always been throughout human history. Will man be allowed to rule himself or will he be rule, ruled by a small elite? And that's what you always have happen. When you look at even you know the Rockefellers or David Rockefeller and the Council on Foreign Relations and, on, and the Trilateral Commission and all the stuff he's done with the UN and the World Health Organization, everything is meant to concentrate all – power of the nation state into a, a small body ultimately the un run by them run by technocrats i mean klaus schwab is kind of basically taking the torch from david rockefeller and he's now kind of the main guy the main focal point but their agenda continues on unimpeded i mean their stated goals are they want to reduce humanity down to like 500 million people and well, what does that mean? If there's almost, what, seven and a half, eight billion people that remain on Earth, that means that those people aren't going to be here anymore. Yeah, so use, how do they – Useless eaters. Yes. How, how do they plan to do that? And it's like so this is all of the elite, the richest, most powerful people in the world getting together all going, yeah, we need to get rid of most, you know, most of humanity and you know, concentrate all power in a global authority and do away with the nation state. And you say, well, why doesn't – Biden want to build a border wall. Well, in their minds, the future they're building that they all say they're building, there are going to be no borders. So to them, building a border wall to keep people out is just an absolute waste of money. They'll just have to pay money in the future to tear it down when we no longer have the nation state. And this is something that literally from the moment the country was founded, it we've been fighting ever since. And one of the things Thomas Jefferson said, every democracy that ever existed in history has murdered itself. And so what they looked at is like, what can we do to prevent our country, our republic, from murdering itself? And their goal was to distribute as much power as possible away from the central government all the way down to the state and local level. That's why we're a republic. We're literally 50 individual countries that are part of a union because they're trying to keep the power away from the federal government. The federal government is supposed to handle the foreign affairs and our state governments are supposed to handle the individual affairs of the state because where you live in Georgia, I don't, I don't know the city. I don't know the town. I don't know the politicians. I don't know the parks. I don't know the safe areas, the good areas, the dangerous areas where there may be dangerous wildlife or whatever. The people that live near and around you are the ones that are going to know it most. Just like where I live, I'm going to know what's going on here way better than – some jerk off that's in Washington D.C. passing a law that's never even visited my city, and so and that's, who and who hates your flyover city? You yeah, know, exactly. That, that, that absolutely loathes the idea of visiting your city in the first place. Yeah, governments are comprised. Movements and governments are comprised of people, and at the core level, no matter what movement it may be, whether you look at oh Republican Party, Democrats, right, Repub uh, Libertarians, whatever, right. Whatever banner or movement you want to just place a bunch of people under and say, yep, here we are. At the end of the day, it is the individual that makes up that group. That's what we have to really concentrate on is the power of the individual. The power of the individual to choose and to have sovereignty over their own life and their own decisions, their own safety, to make their own choices, and to voluntarily commit or not commit to whatever they want to do. As long as they're not hurting another person. So... I think when we look at it at that really at that core level, that's what we have to concentrate on. Societies are comprised of people, and that's where it starts. And we have to do a better job of producing the best minds that we possibly can. Like when you look back in the fifties and sixties, we were put we our our athletic programs were on point. Like you had high schoolers that like you look at old videos of the high schoolers in gym class and like all the young men have six packs and good quads and the women are pretty and slim and they're in shape and everyone looks good. And there's math scores are good. Like, you know, they're raising future scientists and future leaders. Like our institutions were set up in a way that 
were meant to take these men and women and make them the strongest, most beautiful and capable people they could possibly be, physically fit, mentally fit, right, in a position to take over. They were raising the next generation of people who would then take the reins of society. What do we see now? A complete degradation of that idea. It, to, to, to say that our modern um, you know, uh, educational institutions, that they honor that same principle as like from the 50s and 60s, the nuclear family and that whole idea. No, now it's a bunch of Marxism and woke bull crap. It's not about teaching people how to become the leaders of tomorrow. Teaching it's about teaching activists. them how to become the slaves of tomorrow, not the leaders. Teaching them to become Marxist activists yes. and to agitators. Become, to become the lemmings of tomorrow, the slaves of tomorrow. They, they want them to become, you know, the, the workers, like the, the, the underlings, you know. They don't want you to become a leader. They're not, the, the, in finance, the, these institutions are not raising leaders anymore. That's the issue we have to really tackle if we're going to move forward in this country and have a degree of success that we can be proud of, for sure. Well, as a, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but on the back of all of my books, there's a quote by Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, when I first read that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, whenever I saw it, it's like it resonated within me. And the quote says, enlighten the people generally in tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. Sure. And so if the people, if we're enlightened generally, if we understand our republic and we understand the principles of Americanism and what we were founded upon, which is really no longer taught, especially to the younger generations, and people are able to get information about what's going on and what's being done in their name, i.e. Twitter, which you know Elon Musk has cracked the door back open. I don't know how long it's going to stay open, but it's cracked open to where enough of the truth is getting through and you know people are starting to see what's going on they're starting to connect the dots in a way that they haven't been able to in the past because you know 20 years ago we were dependent upon cnn msnbc fox news abc cbs nbc news the new york times and just a small group of news outlets and now what i love about twitter is that whether you want to learn about what's going on in Ukraine or in Russia or in the UK or Australia or in Israel or Palestine or in Saudi Arabia, there are very capable, very competent, very honest reporters all over the world that are reporting the news and the information accurately and honestly. It's just in our news media, what you typically have is narrative control. You have sure. people that all believe a certain way. And they're picking, you know, there's this huge mass of stuff going on in the world, and yet they're just picking out little pieces of it and feeding it to us you know, and giving us a narrative, basically. And now with Twitter and our ability to reach and connect with these, these um, other people, like, you know, give an example, when I start, you know, when the Ukrainian war first started to kick off, all the people that I followed on the right that I thought knew what they were talking about – they were completely wrong on everything. And so I quickly, you know, learned to just completely ignore them on foreign policy because I could tell they didn't know their asshole from a hole in the ground. And through time and repetition and spending time on Twitter and reading and studying people, you get somebody that's, you know, maybe retired Italian army or whatever, and he's retweeted by somebody else that I respect who's always been honest and upfront. And if they don't know something, they tell you. If they turn out to be wrong, they tell you. They don't just say this is for certain what's exactly going to happen. And over time, when you you because most people don't have the time to do these things, you're able to accumulate enough people that are telling you like it is to where you can get a pretty good feel for how things are because you can follow people if they make all these predictions and tell you all these things. And then a month or two later, you're looking at what actually happened. Then you learn to discount what they say. You know, that is so wild that you make that distinction because I always think like, well, our Twitter following has been growing pretty well. And I always wonder, like, I, you know, I was asking myself one time, like, I wonder if they're laughing at me or with me. And it's like, sometimes I wonder that, like, if I'm just the oddity that they're like, wow, this guy in Georgia is like incredibly, terribly wrong on every single thing he makes predictions about. Or like you said, if people go, wow, like Eric's had some banger tweets and some of them been kind of on point, you know, it is Twitter in the battlefield of ideas, okay, or in the war of ideas, Twitter is a very important battlefield that is riddled with holes and riddled with pitfalls 
and very bloody. But at the end of the day, when you look at the narrative of the World Economic Forum and the narrative of essentially what is a world government and what wants to be a world government, um, I think Twitter is a very important in the war of ideas for people to have access to information that is at least as unbiased as it can possibly be. Now, if I give an opinion on something on Twitter and I'm wrong, well, I'll say I'm wrong. I've, I've been wrong before and I've redacted things before and said, hey, guys, I, I had a bad take here. Um, that's okay. But I think just the fact that people are thirsty for that knowledge and people are willing to go, hey, you know what, let's really look at this under a careful lens here. And let's be really careful about what we're going to regurgitate in terms of information, what we're going to retweet. You know, if I've got, you know, a whole bunch of people coming back at me and saying, hey, that's untrue. And here's why. Oh, okay. I'll redact that. Uh, okay, I got some bad information. That's okay. Like, it's the internet, you're going to get bad information. Or when you put out a real banger of a tweet and it goes viral and does really well, where I share a story, it's like, wow, that really resonated with people. Yeah, Twitter is great for writing. If you're going to write, yeah. if you're going to write short things or short threads, it it's really set up to do well with those things. I've seen a lot of people build big audiences on Twitter just by things that they write, and yeah. most of them typically stay away from anything politically just because it's so polarizing. But you know, like I was saying. The, the truth is getting out there and enough people are, you know, so what's crazy about like just, you know, example, like looking at Ukraine, there's like one guy that I've only been following for a couple of months, but all this guy, does, he has another job, but he does this just because he's into it. You know, it's his thing. He goes and he looks at all the Russian telegram channels and the Ukrainian telegram channels and then downloads all the video footage of vehicles being destroyed or battles happening so he can count what it what it was, what was destroyed, and what day, and he puts a log of it out there. And, you know, there's people like that. You know, if there's a story about Lakeland, Florida somewhere, and something comes out, there'll be somebody that lives in Lakeland that's on Twitter that'll go down to the county courthouse and search through the records and, and get documents, look at it, research it, spend his time, connect the dots, and then post what they find on Twitter. And then somebody could be in Germany somewhere and see that and read it and connect a bunch of other dots and it's like mass consciousness of yeah. humanity. Oh my gosh, bro. You're giving me goosebumps because I've totally made that exact same distinction with this sort of stuff. It's like earlier when we were having a uh, brunch, we were talking about how, Hey, when you look at all of the miracles of the human r race, the human existence, like what is the number one, like biggest thing we can hang our hat on and say is like one of the best advancements that the human race has ever come up with. I mean, like the human humankind, right? This, this phone can be the bane of our existence. Of course, like, yes, this can be a very unhealthy item, but it can also be very gratifying. This is also the window to unlimited information. And that information happens so fast, right? We were talking about how, I wanted to kind of elaborate, but we were talking about how even world leaders, right? Imagine, I don't know, you're the prime minister of some country and you've got an issue with, the prime minister or president or leader of some other country or something. And, you know, to think that they don't pick up the phone and, and call each other. I mean, obviously you're just going to pick up the phone and go, Hey, you know, let's solve this. Like when you think about how us guys solve problems, like if, if I have an issue with you, I'm going to call you up and go, Hey, I heard this. Is this true? Like, you know how men handle things. We're, we're cool. Hey, I heard this. Is that true? Oh, you know, and we solve it. We, we work it out and we figure out a way to move forward, you know, it's just weird to think that at that holistic level in terms of how, you know, world affairs are handled and geopolitical affairs are handled, that it could simply just be handled with a phone call like, you know, hey, just like you or I would handle an issue, like maybe they handle it too, you know. And But that used to not be a thing. Like the free flow and exchange of information is so rapid and, and instant and devoid of space. Like, I could call someone in Japan right now and talk to him on the phone. I don't have to write a letter. I don't have to send a carrier pigeon. Like, we're on an uber-connected world now where we can totally have a free-flow exchange of information in real time to readily and quickly audit the information that we're given from the mainstream media, from the government. And that's why these governments are so pissed about places like Twitter. They want to regulate the crap out of Twitter. They want to regulate the crap out of social Misinformation media. Misinformation and disinformation. That's right, because they 
want to control the information that you're being given. They don't want you to have the real information. They don't want you to have the facts. They want you to have the carefully spoon-fed, curated narrative that they want to spoon-feed to you. Yeah, what's interesting about the news cycle is that it things happen in the world, and then typically you have about a two- to four-week lag time. And about usually it's about two weeks. Like something gets reported, and then about two weeks later it makes it to the mainstream media. And things that take maybe like a month to show up in the mainstream media is the kind of truths that they don't like, but it ultimately it becomes so big and so obvious that they can't ignore it because then they look like they're purposely trying to hide the truth, which just further destroys their credibility. And so we have the ability to gain access to information and it gets verified in real time like i love the community notes and how biden and aoc and everybody that's always talking shit on twitter that you know a lot of us that are paying attention know is is nonsense and now they're getting called out with the community notes that have links and data and information that you can go and look at the information yourself and make an intelligent and informed decision Whereas, like, just look at what's going on in the the Israeli Hamas war right now. If it had been the old regime, you know, Twitter 1.0, none of this shit would have gotten out. The, the what Hamas did in Israel would have been sanitized. You wouldn't have heard anything about it. All you would be hearing is that you know the Israelis are murdering the innocent, you know, people in Gaza. And but. The fact of the matter is, is that the Israelis been were dropping leaflets for weeks into the area, saying, you, "If you're here, you need to evacuate because we're basically going to bomb the fuck out of this area." So, for the safety of yourself and your family and your loved ones, evacuate. Yeah, evacuate and get out of there because we're we're coming in. And so, the only people that stayed were the Hamas fighters, the Hamas supporters. And their families, which obviously include a lot of kids. And some of the people were stubborn and didn't want to leave. And in some cases, Hamas just prevented them from leaving. And so what you're, you know, the people that are getting killed in all these airstrikes are the people that refused to leave. They could have any rational thinking person that loves their wife, loves their kids and their family, when you get a leaflet or one of the things the Israelis would, you know, if they're gonna bomb a certain building. They would do what's called a knock, which I think is 15 minutes to a half hour before they bomb it. They drop a big um, weighted um, bag on the roof. So when it hits the roof, it makes a, a loud boom. And then that's their way of saying, we're getting ready to blow this building up, so you better get your ass out of there. I Gives mean, them enough time to evacuate. And, fair chance. And anybody that stays behind and gets killed, it's, you know, the other thing you got to understand is that the whole society has been propagandized for you know almost 20 years since um hamas took over violently and killed all the plo people drug them behind their bikes threw them off buildings murdered them and they've been propagandizing their kids and you can you know we're working on a podcast that chunky and i ha have been working on where we've got all this footage of what was it pioneers of tomorrow is that what yeah, it's called which is basically like a, a Disney-esque Sesame Street-style show where they have all these – one of them's this uh, Mickey Mouse-style character. Another one's a, a bunny. They've got a couple bumblebees, and there are these adults dressed up. And all they're doing is you know, teaching the kids that your whole purpose in life is to kill Jews and to die for the sake of Allah – and that that's the best way to live is to die basically killing and fighting the Jews – and, you know, when you see these things and you see the effect of propaganda, it's the same ideology as ISIS. The, the Palestinians, it's like 64, 75 percent of them, they support Hamas. And Hamas is not interested in a two-state solution. They've been offered a two-state solution since Israel has been around. They don't want it. What they want is they want all Jews dead. They want all Jews to move to Israel so when they're able to, they'll kill all the Jews – then they'll take over Israel and not make it Palestine. They'll make it as part of the global caliphate. That's why you see them all holding up the, you know, the one finger salute like ISIS does, Boko Haram, um, all of these jihadist groups. That's that's what they want. They want to establish a global caliphate, and Israel and the Jews are they're just in the way. You know, every bad behavior that someone you know has in their life is probably taught. 
And when we look at, you know, all of these ideologies and all of these kind of crazy things going on, you see, you know, Hamas and all of these folks that are, you know, engaging in this very, very extremist version of, uh, of their religion and everything like that is, I guess, the only way I can, I can view it. If those things are taught, right? Like, you know, a kid can be taught to love just like they yep. can be taught to murder. And, you know, you think about our children, right? Well, I'm not going to really say too much good about our educational institutions, but traditionally, let's just say in its truest and purest form, you know, kids are taught right from wrong and, you know, their important life skills and, you know, hey, let's respect each other and their civic duties and all of these sorts of things that make us who we are, that define who we are, you know. Uh, a child looks at the mother and the father and observes the mother and the father as they hug and kiss and embrace each other. And the, the young man goes, well, this is how I'm supposed to treat a woman because this is how my father treats uh, my mother, right? You know, th these uh, actions are learned, you know. A woman, a young girl to, uh, learns how to be a mother by watching her mother and, their fa and her father and how they react to each other and how they have their chemistry with each other and the things they do for each other. So, you know, all of these bad behaviors uh, are all learned behaviors. And, uh, you know, in order for us to move past all of this, we have to create an environment where the Palestinians, uh, you know, are taught good things. Like, you know, these kids have to be taught, you know, how to make money, how to be successful, how to be normal people. You know, like, th they can't help what they're born into, who they're born to. Like, all they know is what their parents teach them. And, you know, I, I think that there is a way past all this, but it's just going to involve uh, getting rid of all the murderers and crazies. It's going to involve a lot of killing. It's going to involve some killing. You're, you're you know, not going to reason there ain't uh, no, jihadist out of no this way around ideology. It. They've made the decision. Yep. You know, that die is cast. But the point is, is to say that, well, if these people are just damned from the very beginning, I think it's maybe a, l a little bit harsh to, to, to draw that harsh of a line against them just because of where they're born and who they're born to, when all of these behaviors are definitely learned and yep. taught behaviors. I mean, there's some astrophysicists in there. There's some scientists and doctors and, you know, maybe someone, maybe the cure for cancer is somewhere in that group of people. You know, we don't know that, right? But to limit that possibility is definitely a travesty. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, maybe I'm a little bit too ideology, you know, I have too much ideology or maybe I'm a little bit too positive in my outlook. But I think that, um, you know, that, that bad behaviors are learned. They, yeah. they are definitely learned. And I think that folks in the long term, can be taught right from wrong and, and can be, you know, generations can be turned around. Look at how much our society is degraded just over the last few decades, right? All it takes is one generation to turn things around in a really terrible way or in a really positive way. I mean, we're seeing the results of that right now. Look at the entire uh, breakdown of the nuclear family unit, the, you know, the nuclear family and all this Marxism that's being and the woke ideology is being taught in our schools. It's the same type of thing. An extreme ideology can, can accomplish a lot of negative things depending on who exactly parrots that narrative and who teaches that narrative and who, who receives that narrative and then chooses to use that information uh, to do whatever they're going to do. So, you know, it's terrible. It's terrible to see this generation of people who have been taught to hate and to kill and to do all these terrible things, and that's all they've ever known. You know, to be yep. to think like you yeah, said. Yeah, they don't really have a chance. Yeah, they don't have a chance. They're dead from the beginning. They're, they're already, the die has been cast yep. from the very beginning. Yeah, as General Petraeus said during the surge, you got to separate the reconcilables from the irreconcilables. In other words, the people you can make peace with that want to build a future together with you and the irreconcilables, you either put them in a cage or you put them in the ground because they're not going to stop until they're dead. Yeah. I mean, and that's you, tragic. You experience, experience those guys firsthand in Iraq. It's tragic. It's tragic. And, you know, what do you do? I mean, at what point has a dog bit so many people you have to put them down? Yep. There's no teaching the dog any different. All he's ever going to do is bite people, hurt people. And it's just going to get to the point where he hurts somebody for the last time. You're like, you know what? Enough's enough. You have to put the dog down. Yep. I hate it. But that's, if you want to prevent it, it's the only way to do it. It's a sad state of affairs. War is ugly business. But you have to make a decision. And sometimes that decision is made for you. Sometimes you don't have a, a choice but to react to the decision that they made. Their choices force your hand. 
not even your decision. You simply have to react. And I feel like that's what the Israelis are doing. They need to finish them off. Because if they, if they leave Hamas in power or any of those, you know, they need to go after those cocksuckers that are being protected in Qatar as well. Mas I, already, I saw an article the other day that the head of Mas Mossad says, oh, we're going after them. So those are all a <laughs> bunch of dead men walking. If Mossad wants you, they're going to get you. Yeah. They'll have a, they'll have a son of a bitch come out of a bowl of rice and get you. And that's one thing that people are good at is espionage. That is one thing I will say the Israelis are quite good at. If they want you gone, they're, you're going to be gone. Mossad always gets their man. You better believe that. That's a fact. Good hunting.